and welcome back to the Lucid Dreaming Podcast. It has been a long time, as often happens with this podcast, but I'll give you some good news. I do have two episodes recorded for you, and so after this episode that you're listening to right now, I will be releasing another one not very long after. I still need to um, edit and uh, record the intros, but um, it's coming very soon, so bonus two for one. Now, I want to keep this intro short, but I did want to share um, about something about this new and, and excellent virtual meetup group called Tech for Dreaming, which is mainly focused on tech for lucid dreaming. And it's about, it's approximately once a month, and the events range from presentation by experts to community discussions and, you know, dissecting studies and looking at all the surrounding um, topics about tech and lucid dreaming. It's really, really good. And uh, um, you can actually also watch the previous event recordings on YouTube. So I'll link to both of those in the show notes, which you can find on the episode page on luciddreamingpodcast.com. Now, today on the podcast, I speak with Karen Conkley, who researches lucid dreaming at Northwestern University and has recently led a fascinating and really clever study on two-way communication in lucid dreams. So without further ado, let's get into it. How did you end up in, in lucid dreaming research? Do you want to continue on that? Is that like a stepping stone or what, what's, where, where do you land in all, all that spectrum? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you brought that up because I, well, all my whole life, you know, I was also really interested in consciousness and the dimensions and what is reality. And, and I never knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. And then when I started college, I was in this class about storytelling. And there was an article that somebody wrote about like lucid dreaming as the the, the marriage of like your subconscious is writing a story and you're reading it. And I was like, Oh my God, somebody wrote an academic article about lucid dreaming, which I had been obsessed with forever. I've been keeping a dream journal and reading books and I was having lucid dreams and freaking out about them in class. And then when we read the article, I was like, somebody did this as their job. Like I'm going to try to do that. And so I think my original like scientific interest in lucid dreaming was I also, I thought it would crack the code of consciousness. I thought that like, if you could get the neural correlate of going from, non-lucid to lucid, I, I thought that's consciousness. Like there it is. And like, I don't think that anymore because I, I think that you're conscious even in a non-lucid dream, it's just different. And so like that kind of for a while, I was worried that I wasn't going to be interested in it anymore or like that I would get tired of it. And then as I've progressed in research and like learned a lot of other stuff, I kind of, I, my interests, grew actually because i was like wow this is a really unique state of consciousness that like isn't very well studied and so yeah and it's and it's interesting because it's a unique one that a lot of people still experience but it's not in and now we're kind of immersed in it so i I don't it's harder to gauge what the you know in the zeitgeist kind of uh conversations are there but you know it's not a commonly one that that is talked about in regular conversations we have like sleep awake dreaming you know unconscious but like there is this weird middle, you know, hybrid kind of state that is just fascinating that it exists at all. Um, yeah. And it's not that common in, in conversation. So I, I always found it uh, fascinating. And of course, started getting into meditation and reading about psychedelics and altered states and all sorts of things and realized just how intricate that spectrum actually is. Um, and what, what's interesting is I, I was in a, I think it was a conference on, uh, neurofeedback and one of the presenters um, was talking about his what he used to do is just go around the world and put people mostly in EEG but when he could an MRI and, and other scans um, to record to have a catalog of states of consciousness you know under some recording uh, apparatus and he pointed out that there are some psychedelic states that are almost, from his perspective, were really, really close to uh, lucid dreaming. I don't remember which ones those were, but, you know, I think it was something like mescaline or LSD or or one of those. I I think I, I think I might also know what you're talking about. I I, I forget his name exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So I want, definitely want to talk about your, you know, the, the, the study that, that probably gets you on (laughs) a bunch of interviews and, and, and uh, media contacting you. And, um, 
what's cool to me about the study and the, the, the short version of it is basically a two-way communication and lucid dreaming. I mean, first of all, um, it is really, I think people sometimes miss of just how extensive and worldwide kind of study it was. So there was multiple teams and more, multiple places in the world. Um, and the other thing that is missed that I want to dive into as well, but I'll just bring it up, is that there is um, beyond just the sort of two-way communications, which we'll get into how that works and how you, you figured it out. Um, you've just also induced a lot of lucid dreams in a lab, which I think is remarkable and should not be uh, 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 skipped over in conversations about this. So the first question would be how, who, and this goes to research in general, how did this concept come about? How do uh, teams end up coordinating across the world? Who's running that? How, how did you end up involved in this? And what's the story? Yeah, I think that um, the the coming together of this project was a very beautiful story and very lucky for me. So my advisor, Ken Paller, thought of this idea like five years ago, and he, he had people trying to work on it as side projects for a long time. So he like found this poster somebody did in 2015 of like what the design of the study would be, trying to ask people questions while they're sleeping and answer them. But nobody had actually succeeded in doing that, in part because it's so difficult to induce lucid dreams in the lab, even with experienced lucid dreamers. And so I was, you know, I was in college back then and I, I've been trying to go to grad school for lucid dreaming and I got a lot of feedback that that was going to be really tricky and there might not be an advisor that would want to study that with me full time. But then I went to this sleep conference and was just sitting in on this lunch session with Ken and he was, he studies playing sounds during sleep to improve memory consolidation. And so that is that's the angle that he came about this interest from. And people started asking him about lucid dreaming and he was answering all these questions. And I was asking him a bunch too and sitting there thinking like, I think I could really help with this project. <laughs> and then um, and then afterwards I like emailed him and I met other people that were also involved in the project and they helped me apply to grad school. And it just turned out to be a beautiful, beautiful miracle that that's exactly the project that he wanted to put more energy into. And I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And so I was his first student that was dedicated to studying lucid dreaming. And when I got to Northwestern right away, I started running subjects on this paradigm. I used a, a different method of inducing lucid dreams and changed some things around that people were doing. And by like Christmas of my first year, we had some examples of two-way communication. So that was really exciting. And we thought we were the first ones that did it. And then we realized that actually somebody had already done it in Germany in 2014, a colleague named Chris Appel, but his was never officially published. He published it as a master's thesis, but it wasn't peer reviewed. And so we were like, we knew we were going to work with him. And then Ken had also agreed with um, our collaborator in the Netherlands, Martin Dresler, that he was also going to try to do the same thing. So we knew that we were going to be on the project with those three people. And then we were at a conference with Ken's old postdoc from France. And she was like, we were like, oh yeah, we have this secret project. And she was like, I did that already. <laughs> I did that too. And so we were like, okay, like you're, you're in too. Instead of kind of competing to see who could publish it first, we just decided to put everything together. Oh, I love it. Which is so awesome for lucid dreaming research when it's hard to get a big sample. That's size. amazing. I mean, it's, maybe it sounds for some people like inside baseball, but I'm absolutely fascinated by how this comes about because Again, I, you know, I have a kind of a secret mission also to try to support and encourage and, and understand how lucid dream research comes about. So that is absolutely awesome. And I'm, I love the collaborative nature instead of competitive one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so happy that we ended up doing it like that. And if, for a little while, it was like, okay, everyone's data is in such a different format. Like, how are we going to combine it all together? You have to use some non-traditional methods, but it ended up being super worth it. That's cool. So before we get to the two-way communication part, I wanted to ask you about the the induction. I think you you, uh, you had a, a system. Is the targeted lucidity reactivation basically your induction method? Yeah. Or is that a name for something else? Yeah, that's the induction method that we use in the United States and in the Netherlands. But it was actually developed. I helped develop it with my friend Michelle Carr before I started grad school um, at Swansea University. And so 
the original goal was just like, okay, lucid dream induction takes a lot of effort. You have to spend a really long time doing all this stuff, reading about it, like caring about it. And we are kind of like, how little could you do to still get lucid dreams? And so what we wanted to do was kind of use some techniques that my future advisor at Northwestern was already doing, like associate a lucid mindset with a sound really strongly and see if we could trigger that again during sleep. And so it's similar to like doing a reality check and using like a lucid dreaming mask. We just, as people, we just, we told people about lucid dreams for the first time. Like some had never had any, as we were wiring them up with electrodes when they came into the lab. So there was no like previous training or anything. And then we just had people go to sleep. And before they went to sleep for 20 minutes, they associated a like a beeping sound or a flashing light with the becoming lucid, like while you're awake mindset. So they were to become critically aware, vivid in their thinking and kind of like what, what qualities of lucidity could you have while you're awake? And so we just guided them through that, hear the sound, get in that mindset, see this light, get in that mindset. And then when we pl played the sounds and lights again during REM sleep, 50% of the participants had a lucid dream that was objectively verified with EEG in the lab in a, in a, like a, the whole thing took two hours and 50% of the people had lucid dreams. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So we were like, okay, like this rocks. <laughs> um, and then I got to Northwestern. I was like, we have to do this. This works way better <laughs> than like the other methods. Yeah. And then at Northwestern, it was a little bit trickier because we were just really lucky the first time everyone had REM sleep. And at Northwestern, hmm. like only half the people had REM sleep. So half the people have REM sleep. Now a quarter of the people are having lucid dreams. It was taking a little longer, um, but we're still excited about the method and working on different ways of. Is it is it because uh, people are not used to sleeping in a lab with electrodes on? Yeah, and the setup was a little different. Like at the first in the first study, we didn't use as many electrodes. In the second study, we used a whole cap, and so like the cap is uncomfortable um, and just like a m more of a process. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And there's like a little, there's a tidbit in there that I, w I wanted to ask you about. You, you talked about it in the tech for dreaming uh, meetup, which I'll, I'll link to the, to your, to your talk in the show notes. You've actually, te this is this is clever. If I understand it correctly, you've tested people's auditory threshold. Was that for the sound of induction or for later for when you're asking them question while they're, they're lucid? Right. So during the two way study, we tested two different sound levels and like there might be a more official way to do it but all we did was just present the the lucid cue really low and then we raised it until we just said could you hear this and then when they said yes we kept on raising it and said what's a comfortable volume for sleep and people almost always like overestimate how loud something will be if it mm. uh to wake them up so i always started out right at the very lowest that they could hear it to try to induce lucid dreams and then after a while or after they became lucid, then I would ask the questions. And so I, I did two separate tests while they were awake. I did it for the beeping sound. And then I also did it for a few math problems so that I could know like what's what's that the lowest level that they could possibly hear and what's a little bit what's a little bit more comfortable. Did you actually ins ensure that when you're asking them the question while they're uh, dreaming that also came out at particular decibel that you de determined ahead of time? Right. So. I was controlling it um, in real time. So if people, so if I asked a math question or a lucid cue and didn't get a response and they didn't seem to be waking up, I raised it just a little bit and I kept on raising it until they woke up or answered um, or it seemed like their their brainwave patterns were a little activated. So then I would keep it a little quieter. Now, you, you've said that you, you, you tried to turn this into a, an app, right? Yes. Um, and, and it didn't work as well or didn't work quite well as, do you know? Why? Or you have a theory? Is that, did I say that at the lucid dreaming meetup? Um, you might have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, we actually are reanalyzing the data and it does seem like it's working. Oh, cool. So, but it's, and, and how, can you talk about that app, how to, how it works? Like people are, cause you don't have REM detection at home or wherever. Right. So the app, the idea of the app was just to say like, could we transfer this method for people to use at home with as little, as low tech as possible? So what the app does, and it's available only on Android right now, is just um, it it guides you through the lucid training before you go to sleep, and then it just waits six hours, and that is so to approximate a time when you might be in REM sleep, and then the it 
the Q calibration is very careful. So like it also tests your threshold and then it, um, it starts presenting cues at a very low volume and then it detects movement. So if you mm. move a little bit, then it goes back down. Or if you wake up, then it waits for a while and goes back down. And so the app, it, it doesn't, I don't think it would probably, it's not going to work probably for 50% right. of participants right. in 90, right. you know, in a short period of time. But in a week, it did definitely increase many people's lucid dreaming frequency. That is remarkable. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And so one one other caveat of the app is that because the cues keep marching up, like the goal is to catch people while they're in REM sleep with the right level of cue, but like there's but then they keep going up, right? So the app's probably going to wake you up. Yeah, I mean, I would I would just set it such that uh, it reaches some maximum and maybe that maximum is lower than what they said they they think they'll be comfortable. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. and then if they if that didn't work, um, raise it the next night over instead of always raise it until, you know. Right. Yeah. We're trying to find the best maximum. Like maybe if it, if there's one volume where it gets incorporated into the dream, I think we actually did incorporate this at one point. I didn't program it, but I think, I think actually on the second version of the app, it might be that if the sound gets incorporated into a dream and they report that, that might be the maximum. Yeah. I think the reporting in the morning or when they wake up is the feedback that you might need. Right, right. And so the, the tricky thing about not monitoring sleep is that the sound level that would wake somebody up in different sleep stages is really different. So like if somebody is in deep sleep, you can play a really loud sound and they'll totally sleep through it. But in REM sleep, that sound would wake them up. And so that just adds a level of trickiness when you don't have like the sleep stage specific cueing. Yeah. Um, maybe we should talk some other time too. I'm curious just on, you know, uh, on the app development side, I'm an iOS developer, just so happens. So, oh, cool. You know, uh, again, I'm looking for ways to to help more with, with these kind of tools. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. And there aren't a lot of low-tech tools that I think are really, like, actually effective enough for people that I would recommend people use them. Yes, there's all sorts of tricks and people can get placebo themselves into stuff or really just get enough of a cue, but... If it's so unreliable, it actually frustrates people more. Yeah. But once you once you pass some kind of threshold of success, it's it's worth it with just a little frustration to to keep tweaking it and and get something to work until one day we have a better solution, right? Right, right. And and the other reason we're excited about the app is because like you can do more tweaky experiments without the like huge investment that in lab study requires. So like I don't have to be there for like yeah. six hours yeah. while people are sleeping, Watching and we sleep. could just yeah. test the training a little bit or <laughs> tweak the sounds and see if that has an effect. We haven't done that yet. But. Yeah, well, that, I think that's very cool. Also, that you you figured out a, a very effective method for in lab you know, induction, because that's just was the barrier to entry for so much of the studies. And maybe even some of the quote unquote flaws of, of previous studies is just a, a low number of, you know, successful lucid dreams to test anything with, and you just don't have enough data. Yeah. And we still, I don't think we've completely overcome sure. that problem. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely still a lot of room for improvement, but at least progress is. I'm curious if number of participants in a study is, I mean, is it a multiplier like that it's hard to get or, or is most of the cost of a study is about the, the setup and time and then just, you know, paying people, I don't know, 20, 50 bucks or just some volunteers is not really the extra cost that right. goes into a study. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like the, the cost of a study in our lab, like participants, we pay them like $10 an hour. It's not if you look at like a, a big grant, it's not that much. Electrodes are pretty cheap. The The EEG system that a lab has that requires some initial investment. You want to have a good one. Um, but like w one thing that probably does matter is like, well, first of all, our, our lab is housed in a university. So like that, that kind of space is already paid for. But like when we get a grant from the government or something, then part of that goes towards paying the university sometimes. And also a lot of it goes towards like, um, like the employees. So I'm, I'm not getting paid by a grant because I'm getting paid by the university, but we have two lab managers that get paid by all the grants. And so kind of personnel and like, and then the university is kind of paying for some of the personnel that. And there's only so many people you can fit 
in a, in a sleep lab at any given night, I'm assuming, plus the techs who have to monitor and activate all those things, uh, in addition to, to you, um, you know, and then, then you just, that will multiply by the n number of nights based on the number of people you need in the study. So that's probably tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of, I'm the only one that runs overnights in our lab. So, well, no, that's not true. A few people are starting to do it and I, I'm like the third person or something, but that is, there's not a huge cap on that, but there is definitely like, um, you know, right. Like right now I'm, I'm not, I could only run one subject at a time and that's like, you could right, maximize right. that more. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard to duplicate you with, <laughs> with your knowledge and ability. Um, but uh, if you have to in real time monitor, you know, EEG to uh, to say, okay, yes, they're definitely in REM, or yes, they've 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 signaled for the fact that they're lucid. Um, that requires knowledge to do that, right? We don't have automated systems. Yeah, and you could definitely train other people to do that, and that's something that I'm working on. But I, I'm always like, there's there are a lot of decision points that you need to to deal with, and so like we, we haven't machine learning the heck out of that yet. That's not a thing yet. <laughs> I know machine learning for even sleep staging is still pretty. I mean, I, people are improving it, but like the studies that we do are always playing sounds in a specific sleep stage, and we still do that like manually. I think that one could work on it with machine learning and there are some devices that are doing it, but I think that the gold standard is still to do it manually. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, we, uh, we beat, uh, humans in, in chess and go, but not yet in uh, a sleep stage recognizing. I know. Yeah. But it's coming. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And we're, we're we are actually working on a different type of app that will try to use machine learning to detect signals that sleepers are giving in dreams. So we're going to try to have them sniff and then we're going to see if we can detect the sniff and then present some stimuli afterwards. Oh, wow. <laughs> Don't know if it'll work yet. That's interesting. Yeah. I've, 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 so some of the, some of the types of study I've uh, studies I've, I've wanted to someone to either create or to help facilitate are this kind of cataloging all of the attributes of sleep and dreaming that relates to lucid dreaming. Like, again, get as much just raw data of, of right. confirmed lucid dreaming in EEG um, in every other measurement, heart rate, respiratory, all of that stuff. Um, figure out what, is, what are cues that, you know, a person can still, that unique, that, that can still, you know, communicate from the dream to confirm a lucid dream to help indicate automatically that they're lucid. You know, we, we've talked about like muscle twitches and, you know, electricity in, in, in different, you know, parts and things like that. The sniffing is fascinating, you know, I, and I've not heard that one yet. Um, and so I think there was also, this could be a, a good lead into the two-way communication. But before I forget, what I wanted to ask that relates to that is, do we still not have a at home EEG setup that is that would be considered good enough in order to use for you know for studies. I know I know there's a, a kind of a limitation if you want to do double blinds, if you want to do stuff that's not like just self-reporting that you want to confirm that they were in bed then asleep and all of that additionally to the recordings uh, that that limits that, but you know at least it's useful for some data. Yeah, people definitely use those. I think that like there's there's a, a bunch of different types. There's some where a person could come to the lab, a tech could put EG on them, and then they could take the thing home and it would record their data. There's different headbands. There's the the Z Max and the Dream headband, and those can collect data and you can score it pretty good. And and one could do a lucid dreaming study probably with that. Um, you have to make sure that you can distinguish between like eye movements and stuff like that. But I think I think you could like it wouldn't be impossible like one could definitely do that and get signal verified lucid dreams at home the only thing is that like f to my knowledge the interactive piece of that would be difficult like i don't know how like somebody could i could watch somebody's data while they're at home but if it was like a independently contained lucid dreaming thing then i think you could do it at home yeah something like you know let's just um let's just record data and i think you mentioned somewhere that like up and down eye movement is very unusual in, in regular dreams. Is that accurate or, or something like that? I don't know if I said that. Sometimes we use those as signals. Um, but I think in, I think in general, it, doing a repetitive 
clear eye movement at, at a steady pace that's really dramatic it could stand out whether it's up or down or left or right yeah i suddenly started thinking like how often do i look up and down versus left and right but it's a little harder it's, yeah exactly <laughs> i think it, it just feels different right it's a little more yeah. more effortful um diagonally how common is that that must be like a unique <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if it throws off the eeg reading but um it's worth looking into yeah i think you could learn to to tell those apart better. And, and sometimes we think about that, like how many different signals could somebody give? I, I guess another, another kind of cap on that is like, how many things am I going to have my lucid dreamers memorize before they go to sleep? Right. right. <laughs> sometimes a lot, I'm up to like four. But <laughs> so, um, so that, that's, that's uh, an interesting part of the study that you've done. So basically the concept was we're going to put people in the lab, uh, induce a lucid dream, verify that they're lucid and then see if we can ask them questions and get a, a valid answer, right? Yep. So how how um, how was that set up? What was the uh, what were the prompts? What did you want to ask them? Uh, how were they able to answer? What did they have to know in order to reply? Yeah, well, it's really interesting. So, like as I said before, the teams came to this like study design independently and three of the four agreed on math problems. And so originally when I joined the lab, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if math problems are going to work. Like there's that study about people who ask their dream characters math problems and the dream <laughs> characters are bad at it. So like, what if people can't even do math in their sleep? Um, <laughs> but eventually we are kind of like, okay, like the reason we decided on math problems is because you could have a clear answer between we just use one to four, but like without having people memorize that, you know, yes is left, right, and no is up, down, up, down, and maybe is straight. All I have to do is know how to count. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so we, we mostly did it because there was multiple answer options without like a complicated scheme for how to produce the signals. And so what our lab did was we just had a bunch of math problems that were randomly mixed up and all the answers were four or less. And then after people had lucid dreams and they would give us a signal that they were lucid and then we would softly present the math problems. And sometimes they would answer, uh, with the like left, right, one left, right, corresponding to each number in their response. So if it was like one plus three, then they would just look left, right four times. And if they successfully did it, then we would wake them up and get a dream report. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. What, uh, what was the, what was your conclusion or success rate? Like how, how successful would you consider what, what the results you got? Right. So when we were writing the paper, you know, each, team had different different methods and different types of subjects and stuff like that. And so our kind of goal for the paper was not to quantify how often it actually happened. Our the goal was just to say that yes, it could happen it. in future studies yeah. should should develop methods to make it happen more. Okay. So the official count is that um eighteen point four percent of the questions that we asked during lucid dreams were answered correctly. And another 17% were, we think were answered, like we had different people look at the answers and rate what the answer was. And so those weren't clear, but we think many of them were also answered, um, attempted to answer correctly. And there was just a little bit of ambiguity about how the signal was conducted. And then only 3.2 were, were- Definitely wrong, yes, yeah. Yeah, and so that demonstrates that, you know, it. A, dreamers aren't really bad at math. And also, like, it didn't seem like people were just randomly answering, you know, eye movements without knowing what the question was. And then 60% of the time, dreamers did not respond. And, like, something that's really interesting to me is that, like, within a single lucid dream, sometimes people would respond to one question and then not hear the next question and then respond to another question. So, like, I think there's a, really, a lot of interesting questions about, like, how how can you have contact between these worlds and like what is preventing people from hearing it sometimes but enabling them to hear it other times? That's a question that like really fascinated me after this. So I'll, yes, there was a lot of times that people did not answer. It's not reliable and we we don't know why they didn't answer. And so that's something that definitely needs to be optimized before like there's some study designs that just wouldn't, wouldn't work with this because they just don't hear everything. So, so all of those numbers are from people who verify the lucid dream. 
Right, exactly. So that is only looking at the questions that were presented in people who had already signaled that they were lucid. That's fascinating. And yeah. from the and from the dream reports, did you get a sense of like, did they just get distracted or just didn't hear it? Or, you know, the dream was confusing or? Right. It it seemed like so when people responded to questions, it was it was in their dream reports. It wasn't always they didn't always have a perfect recollection of everything that happened. So it's not completely clear to say it wasn't like you know I answered one question and then a robber came and I wasn't listening or whatever it was just like it seemed like it seemed to me like they just didn't those questions just didn't answer the dreams it didn't really seem like they heard a question but like remembered it but forgot to answer it or something like that um so no it's it's I think um it's really interesting because there's so many aspects that you could look at and it's hard to even focus in, in every individual study because you can, you know, ask them a question like, not during the dream, but like, how often do you remember your dreams, right? And then see if there's correlation between the people who, you know, couldn't give you a, a clear dream report, right? you know, versus the ones that did, you know, could be just an aspect of their state. Right, right. One, one, one thing that I'm really interested in following up on one day in regards to this study is like, there's all these philosophical debates about to what extent we could trust a dream report and like are people actually reporting what's going on in their dreams like how is that distorted and so if we have an objective record of a conversation that took place during a dream then you could say okay wake people up right afterwards wake people up five minutes later ask people to repeat that in their dream five minutes later ask people to report it when they wake up and you could start to see like are people actually distorting it or are they accurate are people forgetting because they change states between dreaming and wake or are people forgetting it because they can't retain information while they're dreaming or would they f have forgotten it even if they were awake? And so I think that those, those kinds of things would be really interesting to say. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's no, that's, that's a fascinating thing to look into. Right. And then you have um, the anchor of something from the response that you verified and it, you know, it's accurate and, and legible um, and tested in different ways and see what, see what comes up. Yeah, that would be that would be a good uh, study to uh, to conduct. So I'm curious. I don't know if this is a common thing in in just studies in general, but do people create these particular studies with a goal in mind to I mean, usually there's a goal in mind to learn one or more things, mm -hmm. but also to allow you to understand something so you can do the next research based on that. Right. Was there more than just a goal of like, can we communicate in two directions? Right. Well, that, that was the primary goal, but we also were like, okay, what, what conclusions could we make based on just this study? Cause I think, I think a big goal was to, to open it up for future studies, but like, what could we learn from just this study? Well, one, we could learn that people are capable of, you know, responding to, novel questions during a dream and like that had never been demonstrated before like you you could have a sensory stimulation and have somebody do an eye movement but like i think i think one one aspect of it that's really important is the fact that three of the teams used sentences that were spoken to the dreamers and so like those sentences were incorporated into dreams more so than just a flashing light or a beeping sound like that's complex information and they were able to respond to they were able to perceive it veridically instead of like having it totally distorted or something like that. I think that was something that we anticipated might be a big obstacle. Like we would say one plus one and somebody would hear like, did they, did done. they know, <laughs> did they know that they were going to be asked math questions in particular? Yeah. Yeah. They knew they were going to be asked math questions. They just didn't know which ones. Right. So. And what were the other methods other than spoken word to, to ask a question? Yes. Well, okay. So the, U.S. and the Netherlands team asked spoken math questions. And then the German team asked math questions using Morse code. So Whoa. they did not use verbal sentences. They they taught their lucid dreamers Morse code. And then they wow. encoded the math questions into flashing <laughs> lights and beeping sounds and had the dreamers decode them in their dreams and answer. And so that demonstrates another complex cognitive capability that somebody could have in a dream. It's not like you know, it's, it's just interesting to see what people are capable of in dreams. The Germans then, are serious. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. yeah. <laughs> and then also just a 
fun note is that the French team did something different. They did not ask math questions. They asked yes or no questions. And so they asked, like, they had the answers beforehand. You know, do you like biology? Do you like chocolate? And the dreamers answered yes or no. Oh, nice. And they also did like a, a tapping. So they, they tapped the dreamers hands and then said, how many times did we tap your hand? And the dreamers answered. How how um, how successful were these? Uh, they get sufficient. Uh, Good, yeah. Positive responses. Yeah, yeah. They were their 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 team was really successful. Um, and they another note about that team is that they didn't use they use uh one participant who had narcolepsy. So people with narcolepsy can have lucid dreams a lot more frequently. So their participant fell asleep and had a bunch of lucid dreams. And they did this, you know, they, they asked him a lot of questions and he answered a lot of them. Um, so that's a that's gold a, mine. Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great resource for lucid dreaming research. That's, yeah. We have to catalog these unique people and, and just, uh, just pay them a salary is sit in the lab and just uh, sleep in the lab every day. Yes. Uh, they, they are affiliated with um, like a sleep, research center, or I don't know exactly oh, really? what it wow, is, yeah. but yeah, they, they do a lot of studies on um, people with sleep disorders and narcolepsy. I, I, I was I was thinking about the concept of professional lucid dreamers, right? Like people who, <laughs> you know, until we get better technology or, or t- techniques, um, people who can do it reliably, should, should we should rely on them to... Uh, yeah to study uh, this unique uh, state. Yeah. That, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, the tapping, as the, the, the hand tapping, I'm surprised. Like, I'm curious if that needs some kind of sensory threshold as well, mm-hmm. or does that more likely than the audio to wake someone up? I, they actually got a lot of correct answers with the tapping. Seven out of the 13 times that they tapped, the participants answered correctly, which was wow. better than many of the math problems. So that one was actually pretty pretty good for them. So, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is something where it can tie into devices like the neosensory device from, from David Eaglesman's um, uh, lab, where it's basically tapping to replace auditory uh, input, oh, yeah, yeah. right? So people learn what taps mean and they can understand full sentences. It's, I think the learning curve is, is bigger, but you can start with something simple and it's a, it's a platform you can develop for. They have an API and, and all of that. So I've, I've uh, requested access to that and it, it's just an interesting uh, thing to, to try. So I wanted to know one in general, what would be like the next thing that you would want to that you would want to study about lucid dreaming and what out of this uh, study and, and its results would you want to take and, and, and do next with, you know? Yeah. So some projects that I have coming up, like I think that that one thing that is preventing me from just running forward with this is those non-response cases and like what what's an experiment that would be really informative, even if people only answered sometimes. And so like, I have this whole dream, you know, if you can get people to answer reliably, then you could start doing like all the psychology tests that are done on people that are awake during people, like to people who are dreaming, right? So like you could give them a declarative memory test or a working memory test or, you know, a consciousness threshold test and see like, okay, well, you know, here's here's the neural correlates of consciousness of a stimuli when somebody's awake. Is that the same in a dream or is it different? I think that there's like so much you could learn to like categorize, like to expand our knowledge of human cognition in another natural state. But I think that those studies, like many of the, the, the ones that I have thought of would require uh, communication to be more reliable. And so like, there's a lot of ways you could do that, right? Maybe it just, maybe it all it takes is just training dreamers more. Like the, the French dreamer was really successful, was one expert dreamer. So maybe it's just that, you know, I, I mostly ran people only, I think I ran one person up to four times, but most people I just ran once. Like what if I ran somebody 20 times, maybe they'd be great at it. Or right. maybe it's something about like, when the stimuli are presented, like maybe, maybe you could decode the brain activity and say, okay, right now they could hear it. And right now they, they couldn't hear it. And so that's something that I'm thinking about and trying to figure out like how to do those analyses and stuff like that to see if there's any tricks we could figure out, you know, maybe it it has to do with the volume or just their training or a a preparatory cue. I don't know. There's lots of ideas about that. Um, Yeah. I mean, and there's, there's interesting things about like neural correlates and, um, you know, memory and, and try to like map the brain. I know with EEG, some of that stuff might be more limited than MRI on, or other techniques, 
but things like, you know, if you ask someone to think about uh, their uh, brother um, and, or conjure an image of, of their, their brother. And then, um, and then in a lucid dream, right. You say, can you conjure up your actual brother? And then do you get the same readings, right. you know, in the same areas of the brain, the same associations, is it different? And how is it different? Right. Um, take people with aphantasia, yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah. see, you know, see, uh, you know, my understanding is that because the, um, at least the visual system in dreaming is the same one that you use while awake, more mm. or less, um, versus like imagination where they can't conjure up, but they can actually still dream visually. Right. Um, right. You know, so, yeah. so we're working on something like that right now. We're not using two way communication, just the induction technique. But the, the question is a pretty simple version of the one you proposed. It's just what happens to people's brain waves when they close their eyes in a dream? Ooh. So like when you're awake and your eyes are open, your brain waves are look a certain way. And when you close your eyes, they get really regular. And it's this really visible, obvious difference that you're producing alpha oscillations. And one idea, a simple idea is that they reflect like the, the inhibition of like the stalling of the visual system since there's no input. And so we're asking people to become lucid and close their eyes in a dream and then tell us in the dream, are you seeing something? Or are you not seeing something? And we think that, you know, our original hypothesis was that if they close their eyes and don't see anything, like when they're awake, they should get the same brainwave. Um, and a few people have tried it and it, it doesn't seem like they are getting the same brainwave. It looks this, it, it's different than wake. And so like trying to wrap my head around what that might mean, like a lot of things can affect this, you know, alpha oscillation neuromodulators and, and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it could be, and the analysis is just beginning. We don't have a lot of data, but it could be that, you know, there's one way in which the dreaming brain is functioning differently than the waking brain. And um, just one other interesting note on that is that like, I've heard that like when people are in REM sleep, you know, when, when your eyes are closed and you're relaxed, you get that big alpha brainwave. But when you're in REM sleep, it goes away. And so like people sometimes say like maybe it goes away because you're seeing a dream imagery. But like if you're not seeing dream imagery and it's still not there, it's kind of like it's kind of like a bigger question about what is generating dream imagery and is it the same as wake and how, how that all relates. And stuff yeah. Like that. and, and that's, that's actually really fascinating because there's a few aspects. One closing your eyes in a dream, you aren't actually closing eyes. Right. Do people report that they see blackness or darkness or something like that? Um, cause you, when you're closing your eyes, I don't know if like the natural there's eye movement that also relates to that. And I wonder if you register that as well, like eyes rolling up a little bit or something like that, mm -hmm. but you can close your eyes and look forward mm -hmm. and start noticing your visual field in the darkness and some of the shining kind of stuff. Do people actually read, see that? And that does that register very differently from more colorful, you know, distinct content. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I've tried it a few times and like, sometimes I've closed my eyes in a dream. I don't see anything. And then something appears or like, so we had one dreamer that closed their eyes. Let's see their, their dream. They, they were in their dream and it was already dark. So they closed <laughs> their eyes and it was still dark. And then I think they opened them and it was still dark and they were like, okay, I need to get some visuals so that I can do this experiment. So they started singing. I can see clearly now and then visuals appeared. <laughs> and so um, an another time uh, we've had a few examples where people just close their eyes and the dream visuals go away, which is like the simplest thing to interpret for the experiment. But other times we've had another time where a dreamer closed their eyes and they could still see everything as same as it was before. And so, um, huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not a foolproof uh, experiment, but um, no, it's an interesting yeah. one though. It's yeah. a unique one. I didn't, I'd never really thought of that. I, I love when um, some of the studies that are trying to look at the parameters or the aspects, right? Like is time, you know, to what degree time is different or movements or mm -hmm. speed or perception, um, you know, are there kind of like baked in limits mm -hmm. to what you can do? Can you conjure up? Can you, you know, create, you know, 360 vision right. theoretically, because you're not actually limited right, by right, right. the angle of your eyes. And there are creatures who can, you know, see yeah. a much wider range than we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. all those would be interesting to, to experiment. Yeah. 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 I've thought of a lot of experiments about like, how's your brain 
processing information while you're asleep. And, you know, if you, if you give somebody an auditory illusion while they're awake or something like that, they might like switch back and forth between hearing it one way and hearing it another way. And like, why does their brain do that switching that happened again while they're sleeping? Yeah. There's maybe that wasn't clear, but like, there's a lot of interesting experiments you could do. I mean, there's a, there's a, um, uh, an interesting aspect that I wouldn't even know exactly how to how to study it, but I call it experiential metadata. Uh It's this concept where you, um, there's data about what you experience that is just kind of, it's like a given, but in a dream, you can see, you can, you can see more clearly that it is really separate from what you experience. So you might see someone who looks like your brother, but in the dream, you know, it's your uncle. So you just know it, right? right, right. right? Right, right, But it's it's metadata about the thing. And where does that come? It's almost like, um, uh, information synesthesia uh-huh, of sorts, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. I just read this really interesting paper like two days ago about, um, it was by Sophie Schwartz who studies people with a lot of brain damage. And she was making some comparisons between like what happens in a dream and what happens when you have certain types of brain damage. And like, there's a syndrome that people with certain types of brain damage get called Fregoli syndrome, I think, where they recognize people as other people. So like they'll see a doctor and they'll be like, that's my dad. And an idea is that, you know, you, you know, you have some activation in the area that recognizes faces and you know, you have some activation in the area that has emotions and memories, but maybe it's not being constrained by the the frontal areas that are saying that like these things all go together right now. And so when people have a, a certain type of frontal brain lesion, they get this same phenomenon that, that many people experience all the time in a dream. And so that, that, that's another way to look, look at that question is to say like when else do people get this like maybe it means that area of the brain isn't connected during a dream or something like that that is that is interesting yeah yeah so what would be the thing you would want to study the most uh about lucid dreaming perhaps if there's a coherent answer to that sure there's a lot of things but if you could if you could get like some answer about some aspect of lucid dreaming what what might that be Mm -hmm. (laughs) i have a lot of different layers of answers to this question so i'm trying to figure out what's the best one to answer. I think that um, something that really fascinates me is like the, the the incorporation of sensory stimuli into a dream. So like, how come sometimes you can, you know, if you give someone a flashing light or whatever, how come sometimes they don't see it at all? Sometimes they might see a flashing light and sometimes the light, the light bulb might be flashing in the dream. And like, why does it appear in those different ways? And like, is there any other aspect of human experience that like also relates to that you know i'm having to be yeah. in the in the alarm clock yeah you know yeah yeah exactly and so like i think that like that that's something that i'm i'm really interested in is like when do people shut that out and and when do people get that get that back and how is you know i i think that it might relate to like our waking lives as well like maybe there are <laughs> maybe there's information that we're just not getting you know yeah. Um, I mean, and, and there are things like the alarm or having to pee that you would think would actually reliably wake you up, uh-huh. but instead they get incorporated into the dream. And I wonder to what degree those relate to false awakenings, right? Where you dream that uh-huh. you woke up yeah, yeah. and you start behaving in the world right. and realize that you're still dreaming. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think all that stuff's really interesting. I, I think another question that is really interesting, like maybe not the biggest picture one, but be like, could you, could you modulate or change your brain activity because of something you did in a lucid dream in a way that you couldn't access in any other state. Like people, you know, if you're talking with your subconscious and you give it a hug or whatever, and you like integrate that or something like, would that, is there a way that could you tap into like a processes that you couldn't tap into when you're awake? Like, I think a lot of people have that experience in a lucid dream. So it'd be interesting to like, look at it from a brain study. Like, could you ever far in the future, find some pattern of brain connectivity and, and modulation that, that you would never get during wake, but you could do in a lucid dream. Yeah, I'm really interested in that because a lot of people report uh, experiences like that. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of theories about, you know, it, I mean, it almost too easily lends itself to the notion, oh, of course you can talk to your subconscious and access this, that, or the other thing. At the very least, I would argue that um, a lucid dreaming state can be and often is a state with reduced level of fear. And that in and of itself gives you access to dealing with things that are hard to deal with when you when your trauma reaction, when your fear response gets activated. So similarly to studies that are using, you know, MDMA with 
post-traumatic stress disorder to put you in a state where it doesn't trigger that that stress response and that trauma response. And you can then talk about it. You can think about it. You can process it. Um, the reduction of fear that happens to a lot of people in lucid dreams, myself included, to be honest, I think allows people to then create scenarios in which they can talk on a stage if they're afraid of, you know, and get get actual processing happening, um, you know, in, in this unique state of consciousness, which is why I love the, the, the usability of, of psychology and, and therapy and, and the benefit of a two-way communication system uh, to facilitate that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting idea. I mean, I, I feel like you can definitely be scared in a dream, but like you could also like, Oh, sure. You know, since you know that it's a dream overcome stuff that you could. Overcome yeah. Anyway. And, and, and that's also something to research, right? When and why do some people get like this big drop in uh -huh. fear? Um, and some people, you know, still feel the same amount of fear. There's like this ideas of levels of lucidity or how much awareness you have. Um, but I, I know, again, personally and from, from people's reports, that even in nightmares, like there is some element that if you become lucid, for some people, that fear just drops to zero or almost or close to zero. Or in regular dreams, then they can just actually do things like, you know, fear of heights testing and they go flying and they can still deal with that. So, you know, remains to be seen in, in studies, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know that much about that aspect of the research is interesting. Yeah. So um, I guess the uh, last question I'll ask you about two-way communication, what would, what would you suppose uh, might, might uh, end up being additional um, methodologies for two-way communication, like, you know, different sensory inputs, different, different methods and yeah. other techniques? Well, something that we're working on is like, you know, some of the, you know, if you look at the 60% of non-responses some of those happen because people woke up not all of them but like some of them happen because of that and so one way that we're working on is like is there a response method that could be easier to do than eye movement which sometimes woke people up and so we oh, we're yeah, okay. favoring sniffing so <laughs> people often like in a <laughs> in a you know a sleep apnea study will wear a nasal cannula that monitors your breathing and so we found that if people just like sniff in and out quickly in a lucid dream it can be a really clear signal and it has the advantage of like not messing up their natural REM eye movement. Fascinating. Yeah. So it's nice for like the eyes closed study because you don't have to like do anything with your eyes that could interfere with the study. Right. So we're just having people go like, <laughs> and you can see this beautiful <laughs> signal in the sleep. So um, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the hand tapping. I think that was a cool idea. Yeah. Maybe what you end up with is finding ways to calibrate and each individual might have, a, uh, you know, they're too sensitive to sound, but if you touch them that they, they can register uh -huh. without waking up or, Right. But but the response in the other direction, like the sniffing is, a you know, another clever mechanism where it's not paralyzed and you can actually get a response. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the hand tapping thing you mentioned is cool because I do think that like we sound is awesome in that you can convey a lot more information than like light, like, you know, Morse code is really cool, but it requires a lot of effort and among the participants and stuff like that. And yeah. so like we like just talking because that's what we already do. But if you could like have a sentence from, you know, somebody trained to hear it on their hand or something, maybe that would be a better way to actually communicate with somebody during sleep. Who knows? Um, but yeah, but yeah, I think that those kinds of, those kinds of directions are important and could help a lot. Well, I find it very, very cool, very interesting and very exciting. And I'm glad people like you and, and others are, are doing this kind of research in that lucid dreaming research is becoming more accepted and more, uh, you know, available and, and happens more often. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming on the podcast and talking to me about it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can find show notes at luciddreamingpodcast.com or still at lucidsage.com. They both actually lead to the same place and I might end up redirecting lucidsage.com to the new domain because people keep mistakenly calling it the Lucid Sage podcast, but that's not actually technically the podcast name. But in any case, I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, sweet and lucid dreams.